And now, it's time for another Dice Tower Review with Tom Vassell. I had my usual reaction when I got War of 1812 in the mail, and I said, what? A war game. I'll get around to it. But then I started seeing some buzz on the internet, and I, and I opened it up and looked at it, and I said, well, these dice inside here don't look like your typical war game. This looks, this looks fun. Not that war games aren't fun. They're just not necessarily always for me, especially the deeper historical ones. Light war games, I eat them up like candy. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm glad to say this is a light war game. Does that make it good? Well, not necessarily. Let's look. The War of 1812 actually comes with several, well actually three scenarios that you can set up with. There is the introductory scenario, which is how I set the game up. There's a full scenario, which is very similar. And then there is a 1813 scenario where you can start in the middle of the war. Now these setups are not that difficult because what you'll do is you can look at each space in the board and it will show you, for example, uh, what goes on that space, a blue and a white cube. And then the book will tell you there's a few spots depending on what scenario, like for example, Williamsburg here starts with two white cubes, but the, for the introductory scenario, you're also supposed to add two white and two blue cubes. Now, each of these cubes is representative of one of the five armies involved in the game. The green cubes are the Native Americans, the yellow cubes are the French Canadians, and the red cubes are the British. And so we have the British, the Canadians, and the Native Americans against the blue and the white, which are the, the blue are the American regulars and the white are the, well, the colonial militia that are fighting together. So it's a two on three match, but it's a very fair game otherwise. And what you're going to do for each round of the game, and over here you can see that we have a round marker. There's only two rounds in the introductory game. Uh, other The full game, the game is an undetermined amount of rounds, but it will end after a certain point. And then the 1813 also has some, you know, a specific number of rounds. But you have a bag, and from that bag, you're, each turn, you're going to pull a cube. And then, so I pulled the green cube, so the Native Americans will take their turn first. Then I'll pull another cube, and then see, see the American regulars will take their turn. Now, turns are very simple. On your turn, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to muster. So let's say the American regulars are taking their turn. Down here, they have two mustering spots. There's one over here. You can see on their turn, they're going to add two blue cubes to that spot. And then all the way over here on the other spot, side, they're going to add three blue cubes to that spot. So on their turn, that's the first thing they'll do. If there's not enough cubes to add to the board, so be it. Over the course of the game, some units are going to be put here. Actually, a lot of units are going to flee. And if there's any fled units at the beginning of your turn, you'll take them off and also put them on your mustering spots. Then. Players have a hand of three cards, and each player has a completely different deck of cards. But you'll then the different cards you use, there's all different sorts of cards in here, but they're basically broken up into two types: move cards and special cards. Now, special cards are cards that you will play to do special actions or you know, like to basically affect the battle. But most of the cards you play are gonna look like these movement cards. This says I can move two armies, I mean I can move two army uh, three armies, two spaces. This lets me move two armies, three spaces. This lets me move four armies, one space. Okay? And then there's a few special cards that each of the armies will have that will let you move an army over the seas or a certain number of cubes over the seas. It depends on your cards. Now, when you move an army, a bunch of cubes together is an army. So, for example, here I have uh, an army right here. That's a whole army. And here's another whole army right down here. Here's another army. I can split them and say this is one army another army that's fine and I move them different spaces so I can say ah oh, we all run into here and we're gonna attack here and then these guys I'm gonna, this is my second army we will move up here to reinforce them and what have you okay so you can do what you want as long as you follow the rules of the movement card and when you move into an enemy's area well there's gonna be a battle now battles are very simple in this game each of the different factions has a certain amount of dice in their color and the dice are very different 
Okay, for example, the British regular dice has hits on three sides and blanks on the three other sides, while the Canadians has a runaway token on two sides and a hit on two sides, while the uh, um, Native Americans has a hit on two sides and a run on one side. So you can see that all the dice are different, and there's also a different number of dice for each army. The American regulars and the British regulars only have two dice each, while the other armies have three dice. Now, when, you, when it's your turn, you can roll a die for each unit that you have, but the most dice you can roll are the number that you have. So even if there's 16 white cubes there, I can only roll three dice each turn. So the way that this works is each, uh, the, uh, the armies are going to take turn battling back and forth. Who gets to go first? Well, the army in whose color is the background. So in the background of blues, the Americans always go first. In the black background of red, the British armies go first. And it doesn't matter whether you're the attacker or defender. So you roll your dice. If you roll a hit, your opponents have to decide one of their cubes that's dead. If you roll a runaway token, one of your tokens runs away, which is why the British are great, because they don't have that on their on their cube at all. And the American militia uh, have it on two of their cubes, which is really annoying, and so you often will be taking your own guys who run away in battle and go to this fled cubes. They'll come back, but you know, then it's not that's not very helpful in the battle itself. And you continue fighting until someone dies. Now, if you roll a blank side, that's nothing. However, you may use a blank side to retreat your folks to a friendly area if possible. Although the Native Americans can retreat to an an unfriendly area if there's no one in that spot. So that's that's a, kind of like a special ability they have. If you capture an opponent's victory point spot, and victory point spots are known by stars, you can see Buffalo is worth one, and that spot is worth two. Actually, you can see there's th four spots here next to each other, all worth victory points. You'll put a token in of your color. Now, one of the things that is is interesting in this game is that when you move an army it has to have at least one of your cubes in it but you can move a whole bunch of people for different colors so even though the french are definitely weaker than the i'm sorry the canadians are definitely weaker than the british in this game yeah you can't kill them all off because then on the canadian player's turn he can't move armies around and so you have to keep that in mind uh so the game is is going to progress as people move their armies around trying to capture these different victory points or trying to recover them. But each of the armies has a special card in it that basically allows them to play a truce. It gives you movements, but also gives you a truce. When you have played all the truce cards, the game is going to end. The truce card here lets me move two armies, two spaces each. So, you know, I'm going to want to play it. I'm going to be forced to play it because you must play one of these movement cards in a turn. So you're going to be forced to play it at some point, but it's up to you to decide when to do it. At that point, whoever has the most control markers on the board, which means you've captured, you know, the Americans have captured certain areas on the board, whoever has the most of these is the winner. And it's actually possible to have a tie, uh, but that's basically the game. So what can we say about War of 1812? Well, first of all, I think it's pretty critical that we have to say that War of 1812 is absolutely best with five players. And in fact, I don't know that I would be that interested in playing with fewer. Now you can. When you play with less than five players, you, know, you control different sides and it's no problem. But there's a dynamic with five players because obviously some armies are weaker than others. But when you have that dynamic, you're going to say, okay, we're going to kill off the French armies. Obviously, the English armies are much stronger. And you say, no, I don't want to lose all my armies. Because if you do take away someone's armies all across the board, then they don't have the ab ability to move people. And it's that unique movement, three on two, and yet the Americans, there's a lot of Americans all over the place. It's, it's pretty neat. Now, at first, the game seems very straightforward. Move, roll dice, move, roll dice. And it almost seems too lucky. And in a sense, you have to admit, there is a lot of luck to the game. But there's a lot of strategic decisions. You have to decide how, at first you're like, oh, let's just move whole armies. But you have to be careful because the Native Americans can pop all over the place and take things that, that the Americans have left open. If you leave your spots open, people can just come in with C cards and stuff. And it's not just this huge frontal attack. And you take in a giant group of soldiers and half of them may flee the battle. So there's a lot of things going on and it's really interesting. The introductory game is okay. It's, it's a neat way to learn the game. And I don't know that I would ever play it after that 
for that purpose. I'd rather play the full game or start in the 1813 version where you're already full at war with each other. I wouldn't mind if the cubes were little soldiers. It would, you know, make the map look a little better. Cubes, you know, come on, are we still doing cubes these days? But it does work. And I really like the dynamic of how each player was a little bit different and had a little bit different way that they were supposed to play. And then you had to get along with your teammate because you're on the same side. And yet at the same time, there'd be discussions on who's going to die. It's a very entertaining back and forth game. I would put it on like the same level of Memoir 44. There's a lot more strategy and depth to the game than you might think, but at the same time, it's really accessible. If you're someone who's not a big fan of war games, I'm telling you, this was a good one to get on board because there's not charts you have to look up. There's not all these things. You just roll dice and see what happens. The only people who have a few extra special rules are the Native Americans. Other than that, everyone else is kind of the same, just with different dice and different decks of cards. All the cards are explained in the book. Very simple. So I'm going to give this one thumbs up. I think it's a pretty neat game, and I think that it will have a lot of attraction to people who want to dabble in war games but not get bogged down in giant rule books. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews, as well as our top rated audio podcast at dicetower.com. You can also find the latest board game news at dicetowernews.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching the Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Fun Again Games, the world's best game source. Fun Again Games has over 5,000 games available. Check them out at funagain.com.